Hello everyone, I can see people starting to trickle in, so I'm just going to kick off straight away. Uh, welcome to our webinar on data visualization and mapping and storytelling. We get requests to do this sort of webinar all the time, so I'm really, really excited that we are finally bringing it to you. Um, just a quick bit of housekeeping. First of all, um, we do have a Q&A function and a chat function, which hopefully you can all see down in the bottom of Zoom. So if you have any questions or feedback or just want to say hi, please do drop it in the chat um, and I will get to all of the questions hopefully at the end of the session. Hi, Tony. <laughs> Uh, so, with no further ado, because I've got loads to pack in today because I got a bit too excited about this webinar, I'm going to share my screen and kick off. Hopefully you can see my screen. Perfect. Okay, great. So, like I said, welcome to data visualization and storytelling with maps, tips, tricks and best practice. So I'm really going to be focusing on the best practice side of this today and um, particularly in the context of modern GIS, which is something I'll be talking about a bit later, but I'll be sprinkling lots of tips and tricks in throughout the session. So first of all, just to introduce myself, I think I see a few familiar names in, uh, in the group. So nice to see you all and nice to meet you if I haven't met you before. My name is Helen McKenzie and I'm a geospatial advocate at Carto. So what that means is my job is to get people super excited about spatial analysis, spatial data, all things maps basically, um, which is of course an absolutely fantastic job and I'm very honored to have it. Um, in the whole sort of geospatial world, the thing that I'm probably most uh, excited about and the thing I find the most interesting and powerful is data visualization and data storytelling. So I'm very, very honored that I was selected to do this webinar today. This is just a selection of some of my favorite maps that I have created in my career in GIS ranging from a drive time to Nando's map. If you live in the UK, um, you probably know what this is about. If not, um, it's, it's just a chicken shop that has cult-like status here in the UK. Um, so ranging from that map down to in the bottom left here, we have a map of every toilet in the world. Uh, at the top left, we have a joy plot, which is a way of 3D mapping data, uh, 3D data, basically like a line plot. Um, so yeah, this is, this is really something that I'm really enthusiastic about. I'm so excited to talk to you about it today. So what have we got in store for today? So first of all, uh, I'd like you to come away from today's session, not just thinking of data visualization as an afterthought, but thinking it was a really crucial part of the spatial analysis process that has real value and something you should dedicate real time to. Secondly, we're gonna talk a lot about what is modern GIS and understand the challenges and opportunities for mapping within this context. And then finally, we're going to jump away from these slides and jump into a real world ish example and see how we can use data visualization to solve some real world problems. So let's kick off. Why does data visualization matter? So I always say that bad data visualization is a lot like season eight of Game of Thrones. So you have your great data, you've done some really amazing analysis, spent loads of time really crafting and making sure that analysis is just right. And then if you don't do good data visualization, then you don't stick the landing, you don't stick your season eight of Game of Thrones. And what I always say about data visualization is if people don't understand what you've done, or if you can't make them care about the analysis you've done, what, what was the point in all of that work if they don't understand it and don't care about it? That's why data visualization matters. And something I always say as well is you don't notice good design. So say you're cycling along, you don't notice when there's not a tree in the middle of your cycle path, but you do notice when there is a tree in the middle of your cycle path. Bad design in data visualization is just like this. You don't notice when something has been designed really well because there's nothing sort of in your way. But the minute there's something in your way that's stopping you understanding that visualization or that map, that's when there's a real problem. That's when you notice. So what makes a map bad? Um, now, I do just want to say at the start of this, we are going to look at some examples of bad maps. This is all in good fun. Um, this is uh, not meant to uh, be mean to anyone. It's just a bit of a joke. Everyone has made a bad map in their time. I know I have as well. It's not always the map maker's fault, but I just wanted to look at a few examples to illustrate what makes a map bad. So first of all, a map is bad when it's forgotten where it's going. So here is a map that I imagine was originally supposed to be an electoral map with states colored blue and red, depending on which way they voted. You can see that either the cartographer or the publisher, there was a miscommunication somewhere along the line. And now we just have a black and white, completely indecipherable map in this black and white newspaper. So something to always be aware of is know where your map is going. 
Uh, secondly, a map is bad when it's indecipherable. Um, I come from a background of GIS and transport, and I've definitely made maps like this. I hold up my hand, but I've made, made maps like this, where you just have so much information that someone wants you to put on a map. There's so many different levels to this data, and the data is so, so busy and so cluttered and so noisy that it's just completely indecipherable, and I couldn't take away a single thing from this map. It would be much better visualized as maybe a heat map or only showing one variable at a time rather than the like 20 variables we're looking at here. And also you can see the county boundaries, or I think the local authority boundaries on here are blue, so they look a little bit like rivers. So it's just a, it's just a lot and it's quite confusing. Um, and then finally, when it's forgotten, it's a map. So there's two maps here, the one on the left, absolutely brilliant. I have nothing bad to say about that map. The map on the right, they've sort of used the map as a bar chart. And the thing I always say with a map is the minute you put something on a map, people think that's where it has happened. Even if it's something like this, where you're sort of trying to use geography as a bar chart or use it in a slightly funky way, people will look at this and think, ah, in the south of England, it's all crops. In, right in the north of Scotland, it's all water. And in the marginalia, so the paragraph at the top of this map, it explains that that's not the case. It explains that this is um, a sort of proportional representation. It's not actually tied to actual locations. But 90% of people will just look at that bar chart and not even read that. Or if they do, it'll be the second they read and they've already made up their ideas. So that's just something to think about as well. Always remember that it's a map. And then this one is just, this is bad on purpose. So I don't feel too bad about pointing out some of the flaws here. Um, I'd say the biggest flaw in this map is the color scheme. So this is supposed to be showing uh, sequential data. So data getting higher and higher, starting at a low population going to a high population, but they've used a sort of rainbow color scheme and the colors don't really have any relationship to each other. So it's really impossible to look at this map and understand it without constantly referring back to the legend. And I would say with maps, it's really important to try and always make them as intuitive as possible because people will look at the legend second. They'll look at any text you've written explaining the map, third or fourth. It, they will look at the colors and they will look at the symbols and everything you've got on the map first, make a snap decision about what you're trying to tell them, and then they will look at the details. Uh, so the final bit of this section is just saying, um, remember, just because you understand your map doesn't mean everyone will. So this is a very infamous uh, mapping scandal, if, if such a thing exists, which is where this map is showing uh, areas where there's a likelihood of high hurricane level winds. Donald Trump has interpreted this. You can see he's drawn with a Sharpie. This uh, incident was called Sharpie Gate. He's drawn with a Sharpie the direction of um, the direction that he thinks the hurricane is going in. This map isn't showing the direction of the hurricane. It's showing areas of hurricane level winds. Um, so he's just done exactly what we talked about. He's looked at the map, made a decision about what it shows and not actually read all of any of this information down the bottom. So the takeaway here is make sure you get feedback, second, third opinions, um, of what your map is showing, get people to say back to you, your map is showing me this, so you know that people can understand it, even Donald Trump. So that's what makes a map bad, what makes a map great. Well, I think sometimes we think that a map has to be absolutely stunning and really, really beautiful for it to be great, and that, that would be wonderful if they always were, but it's not all about that. Maps are about generally answering questions really clearly and effectively. And that could go from a map you see on the street helping you get from A to B really effectively, right down to something we're going to be talking about later, which is helping us make business decisions really effectively. It's about doing that in a really clear way. If you can make a beautiful bit of cartography in the meantime, fantastic, but it's not always about that. So following on from that, data visualization doesn't have to be rocket science. And I think this is something people often fear about data visualization. They think they need to put loads and loads of work into it. They need to have loads of skills in it to be really good at it. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think it's something where if you can just have a few clear guidelines and rules and information about what you're doing, then you can do it really easily and quickly. Just gonna check because I see I have 37 notifications. Everything okay? Perfect, thank you. Uh, so, um, I've got a few rules that I like to stick to when I'm creating my visualizations and maps that I'm going to share with you now. So first of all, every visualization should start with a question. And the more specific that question is, the better. So for example, you should always know what the map is supposed to be saying, 
where the map is going. So do you remember earlier, it was going in a newspaper, but the person didn't know, so it ended up completely useless. You need to know why you're creating it. So what it's going to be used for, what problems it's going to be solving, and who is going to be solving those problems with it. And if you're not sure what the question is, you always have people like your project manager, your clients, stakeholders, who can help with that information. So when I say that that question should be really specific, I mean, here are some examples on the right here. This is the kind of thing I mean. So a non-specific question would be, what are income levels like across the United States? But you can make that much more specific by saying, where are income levels highest in the US? So I can roll out a luxury brand. So if you have all that information, that extra level of detail in your question, you can make much more specific decisions that will help your project manager or whoever it is um, get, get to insights faster from the map. And that's, that's all we really want to be doing with our visualizations is it's sad in a way that the less time people spend looking at our visualizations, the more effective it is. Um, so that's what we want to do, shorten that time to insight on our maps. Secondly, a visual hierarchy. So by a visual hierarchy, I mean the, the hierarchy that you have on your visualization, the order that people look at things. Um, you want them to be looking at the key information first and all of the sort of supporting evidence um, and data second, rather than everything being a sort of equal weight and they don't really know where to look first. Visual hierarchy, if you can master that, then you'll have a fantastic map. Uh, resist the temptation to put everything on a map just because you can. So I'm gonna be talking about this a little bit later, but we're living in a world of bigger and bigger and bigger data. This map, for example, I believe shows every pub in the UK. Can't imagine why I chose this one. And sometimes I think we are so excited by that as data professionals, we obviously love, stay, love data. We're so excited by that. We want to show as much as we can. We want to show off the tools that we have and our skills in being able to show all this data, but that's not always the best way for our map user. And then finally, the little things on maps are often the things that we forget to um, look after and check that they are all correct. So things like typos, wrongly labeled places, underscores in legends, incorrect units or no units used at all. These sort of things are really, really common in maps. And they are one of the things they all have in common is that they have absolutely nothing to do with that amazing data or data analysis you put together. They don't have anything to do with it. But the problem is that users will look at them first. They will see that typo. They will spot the underscores in your legend and they will be distracted by that and they won't be making decisions based on your map. So it's all about sort of removing those barriers, those visual barriers to getting them as quickly to the inside as they can. So let's talk a little bit about data visualization in the time of modern GIS. So when I was putting this webinar together and I was looking at resources that were out there online, I feel like there's loads and loads of fantastic resources about cartography in general and how to make good maps. But I feel like most of them are based on sort of static maps and paper maps. And they don't really talk about a lot of the challenges and tools that we as data professionals are using today. So that's something I would like to do now. So when we talk about modern GIS, what do we mean? So there's a really big, long, um, Oh, what's the definition of modern GIS here? But the, the two things that I want you to take away from it that have the most impact on data visualization are scalability. So we're working with bigger and bigger data and it's really important in the landscape that we're in that we have as, and as easier time visualizing really big data as we do really small data. Our solutions need to be scalable. And then secondly, that this sort of new world that we're living in is democratic. So we're now rather than having sort of a few GIS professionals creating maps, we now have systems that are much more democratic, loads of different users are making maps, whether they're data analysts or data scientists, maybe they don't come from a data background at all. So GIS now is much more democratic, um, which throws up different challenges. So let's have a look at some of the challenges in the context of data visualization. So like I said, we're working with really big data huge data these days. People are no longer working with looking at a data set that has 10,000 rows in it and thinking that's a big data set. They're looking at a data set that has 10 million rows in it and thinking, yeah, that's quite big. So what does that mean for you in, in terms of data visualization? Well, first of all, don't feel that you need to compromise on scale and detail. Don't feel like you need to be aggregating your data or only looking at really small areas. What you do need to be doing is going cloud native. So having your spatial data in the cloud in things like Google BigQuery, Snowflake, 
um, AWS, all of these cloud data warehouses will make your processing so much faster and unlock all these new capabilities. If you use a tool like Carto, even better because you can do this data visualization cloud natively. So you never have to take any of your spatial data out of the cloud, do some visualization, whether it's stored somewhere else, it's always just in the cloud. And then secondly, once you're in the cloud, you can really take advantage of cloud native data formats. So for example, in this map you can see here is a spatial index. So spatial indexes are a type of data where the data, the feature is located on the world based on a short sort of, I think it's about 14 characters, a really short string, rather than, you know, with most uh, geometry features, you have a really, really long uh, string description that has every coordinate pair for every corner of the shape. So it gets really, really long and heavy. Spatial indexes are much, much smaller than that. And they're also hierarchical. So they, you can sort of, you, they go from about, I think about 50 centimeters in resolution up to like 50 kilometers in resolution. So you can work with all those different resolutions as well. So that's one really exciting type of data set. And I'm gonna be showing you a bit more about that later and see that in action. And another cloud native data format that is really, really useful is tile sets. The tile sets basically chop your data set up into pre-rendered tiles. So rather than having to render the whole world at every zoom level, and every time you zoom in or zoom out or pan here or pan there, it has to re-render it, it does all of that already. So it makes it much, much faster to visualize big data. And it also has really great storage capabilities as well. So I cannot stress enough how much going cloud native will help you if you want to visualize huge data sets like this. Secondly, uh, we'll be in modern GIS, interactive dynamic visualizations are everywhere. We're not really in a world where we're making PDF paper maps anymore. Obviously there's still a huge market for those and a lot of people are still doing that, but in this sort of modern GIS landscape, it's not something that's happening so much. So what does that mean in terms of cartography? Well, you should not be treating these visualizations like you're making a paper map. You shouldn't expect your user to come into your map and just leave everything nice and prettily how you left it. They'll be turning layers on and off. They'll be zooming around. They'll be loading up pop-ups and that's fantastic. And that's what we want, but you can't design it in the same way that you would a paper map where they can't do those things. So what you really need to be doing is thinking about the journey that your user will be taking as they explore your visualization. And a really key thing here that we'll be covering later is don't overwhelm people with detail. Let the detail emerge with the story. And then finally, we've got loads of new users making maps compared to how we used to, where we used to have just people who had a sort of GIS, maybe academic background. Now loads more people are making, which is fantastic. But you should never assume spatial literacy in your end users. Uh, you should always over communicate the work you've done. I think this is really key, especially if you're not having any sort of face to face um, or e face to e face conversation about what you've done. Always try and over communicate and take advantage of things like pop ups and um, any other marginalia to make sure people really understand what you've done and try and anticipate the needs and questions that people will have. And this is something we're going to really cover later on. So the bottom line uh, with modern GIS is you're no longer just a cartographer. So you're not just designing a map anymore. You're a UX designer. You're designing a UX experience, a user experience. So let's take a look with an example. I'm just going to check time. Oh, I'm doing great. So um, this, is, this is sort of the end of the slide section. Now we're going to move on to a bit of a demo. So this is a question that we are going to try and solve for this man here. Um, anyone from Carter who's on the call might recognize this guy looks exactly like one of our colleagues, Jaime Sanchez. Um, so that's weird. Um, the question that we are going to try and solve is, uh, Jaime Sanchez is asking me, can you just make a map showing which of our potential coffee merchants across New York state have the biggest potential market? We're thinking of expanding. So this is an example of a really good question because we know who is asking the question and who's going to be using it. We know the where, we know the why. We've got a really good specific question here. I just highlighted the can you just section because Anyone who is a cartographer or a data visualizer will hear this phrase about 20 times a day. I know I do, which is, can you just do this? Can you, can you just do this little thing for me? When in actual fact, it might be something that takes two or three days. Um, so that, that's something I just wanted to share because I feel like I hear that all the time. Uh, so we're going to take a look at solving this problem. Um, first of all, I'm just gonna show you the data and a sort of rough outline of the process that I would 
go through to solve this problem. And then we'll take a look at how we can communicate that with data visualization. Uh, so let's come up here. Um, shout if you can't see my screen changing. I think we should be okay. So what we're going to do is take a look at, first of all, the data that we would use to solve this problem. So if you're not familiar with Carto, if you don't use Carto, um, please do head over to carto.com and get yourself signed up for a free two-week trial. And you can copy all of the steps that I'm doing in this analysis today and make them if you want. So um, I'm going to head into Carto Builder. Uh, if I can get there with Zoom in the way. Thank you. Uh, so Carto Builder is our visualization and analytics platform and it's fully cloud native so all of the data that we have in here is stored in a cloud data warehouse i believe these data sets are stored in google BigQuery, and you can use this to visualize your data run analysis and also share this as a web map so i'm just going to run through the data that we would typically use to solve a question like this it's very high level very illustrative if you were actually working for like a cpg company you would probably go into a lot more detail than this but i'm doing a very simple overview so first of all, we have our coffee vendors. So I've taken data for coffee vendors from our spatial data catalog, which is a repository of around 12, 13,000 data sets that for our Carto customers to use. This is a data set provided by our data partner, SafeGraph. Uh, shout out SafeGraph if any of you are in the call. Um, so I've just taken all of the points from their POI data set, point of interest data set that have the tag coffee. So assuming that these people, these locations might sell our coffee. So you can see in here, I'll just bring up the legend. Uh, we've got restaurants and other eateries, we've got gasoline stations, grocery stores, all different types of places that might sell coffee. We've got a couple of other things on here to help with visualization. Like, so this map is really not for anything. It's just to sort of illustrate the data that we have. So it's not really solving a problem. Like uh, all of the advice I've just been giving you this map completely breaks because it's not really for anything. Um, but first of all, we have our coffee vendors. What I've done here is used a qualitative color scheme. So qualitative color schemes are for when you have categories of data that are textual and they have no real numeric relationship to each other. So here, for example, we've got gasoline stations, restaurants, and we've used a qualitative color scheme. Other ones are available like sequential and diverging. I'll go into those in a little bit more detail later. Um, but the really stand up thing about this now I'm going to talk a lot more about different capabilities that Carter has in terms of visualizations later. But the thing I really love about this map is it's using something called a firefly cartography style, which is basically where you can see the points are kind of glowing and in this really nice attractive way, this is a really as much as it's really useful because it's sort of just very beautiful to look at. It's also really useful because it sort of hints at density as well, um, which is a very helpful thing to know about. Um, so the way that I achieve this is in Carto, you can change something called a blending mode. Blending modes are um, a way of changing the way that different colors interact with each other. So for example, with additive blending mode, which is what I'm using here, light colors that overlap each other sort of get added together and they become even lighter and they glow like this. And then all I've done is added on two layers that are exactly the same, but the second one copy of coffee vendors, very nicely named, um, has a slightly higher radius, but it's much more uh, transparent. So you can see the difference when I turn them on and off. Let's just zoom into Manhattan a bit to see a little bit better. So without that extra layer, it looks still, still pretty nice. When you add it on, you get that really nice glow effect. Um, I must remember that this webinar isn't just called Helen Talks About Firefly Maps because I could talk about them all day. So basically what we, uh, just to move on to the analysis side of things and leave that firefly mapping over there. Um, what we're going to do is work out the uh, population who live around each of these potential. And then we're all gonna also look at something called the coffee connoisseur index, which is very exciting. So I mentioned our spatial data catalog earlier. One of our data partners, Spatial AI, have some really fantastic geosegmentation data sets, which basically take resident characteristics and assign them a score based on how well they fit in a certain category. Uh, so here the category is the coffee connoisseur index and they've taken all of their um, online activity. So what they're saying on Twitter, what they're saying on um, threads, I guess now, um, and working out how much they're really into coffee and giving them a score. 
So the score is one where they are really, really excited about coffee, really into coffee. Uh, so someone like me, I've had loads of coffee today. You might be able to tell from the speed that I'm speaking. And zero would be people there aren't into coffee at all. So that's what this data set is showing. Um, so you might be able to see there's loads of gaps in this data set. Um, that's not because the data is missing. That's because this data set is absolutely huge. So if I just move my Zoom face, you can see that we have, this is a census block geography. You can see we have around 12,000 census blocks that we're trying to render on this map. Census blocks are really, really detailed geographies. They're very, um, very big uh, geographies to render. So when you're trying to render 12,000, even when it's stored in a cloud uh, data warehouse and you're streaming it natively, it's still a really massive data set to render. And that's why we have features dropped here. So what I would do in this circumstance, normally if I was creating a map like this to be used by someone else, I would transform this into a tile set. So if you remember earlier, we mentioned tile sets are data sets that basically pre-rendered images that um, are broken up by different parts of the world and different zoom levels. I would transform this to a tile set and I would not be having these problems at all. But we don't really care about visualizing this data set. This is just going into some analysis. So I won't bother with that for now. What I am going to do, however, is transform it into a spatial index which is what you see here. So spatial indexes, like I mentioned earlier, are geolocated on the world by a short reference string, which makes them super fast to analyze and visualize and absolutely fantastic. So this spatial index is just showing population across New York state. If I zoom in, you can see it's at a hexagon grid level. So this is what, this is called H3, the spatial index I'm using. So this is what that looks like. And you can get some really amazing visualizations out of spatial indexes because they can be so detailed and you can get some great 3D visualizations out of them as well. One of the really handy things about them, if I just head into here, is you can change the resolution that they render at. So if you remember, I mentioned that spatial indexes are multi-resolution. So at the moment, I've got it on its most detailed resolution. But if I just turn this up, say three, I can basically change the aggregation level and it's not having to, it's not reanalyzing this data, it's just rendering it differently. So I can change that. And this is really helpful depending on the kinds of insights that people were looking for. So if someone was saying to me, I want to know which neighborhood in New York state has the highest population, you might want to look at something like this, but because we're doing something much more detailed, we would want it um, to have a higher resolution and something else that is really nifty. I've just broken it up been changing it too quickly. Um, something else that's really cool about social indexes is as you zoom in and out, the resolution of the data changes. So you can see this happening as I zoom, it gets more and more detailed the more you zoom in until you get to here, which is the, resolu the native resolution I rendered at. So that's really helpful for helping you make sure that your user is not being overloaded with information. Remember we said that it's really important to reveal detail bit by bit. This is really helpful for that. And then just before we move on, I just want to show you one of my absolute favorite ways of visualizing spatial indexes, which is as a 3D map. So I'm just gonna change the base map. So you can see up here in Cartier Builder, you can change the base maps. At the moment, we're using Google Maps Dark Matter. I'm just gonna switch over to Cartier Dark Matter because you can have a much more extreme pitch. So 3D tilt basically when you're mapping things. Um, one of the questions I get an awful lot about maps is why do I always use dark base maps? There's a couple of reasons. First of all, I think they're much easier on your eye, particularly on screens. For printing maps, I almost never use a dark base map. I normally use a light base map because they print so much better. But for screens, I think they're much easier on the eye and they're also much easier to contrast your data with. Um, I'll show you what I mean a bit more about that in a second. But I was just gonna quickly show you our 3D version of this. So let's switch the map to 3D. And then to make a 3D map in here, all we need to do is head back into our layer style, turn on height. And then we just need to, oh, I've already done it. You just need to make sure, change the height to whatever variable you want it to be shown by. And then you can change the exaggeration. If I turn it up, it'll go absolutely mad. Um, but I'll just turn it to about that. So this is amazing. Normally like 3D maps are, so they take so long to render. If you use anything like Blender, which is a really fantastic tool, they take a really long time to render. They're really, really complicated to get 
all the visuals just right. As you move around, they have to re-render all over again. But with spatial indexes, it's just incredible the sort of speed that you can generate something like this, but also it still be interactive. And if someone said to me, make a population map, like a population density map of anywhere, I would normally do something like this because it's such a quick, intuitive way of really showing the demographic shape of an area. So back to, back to our use case before I end up just talking about how amazing spatial indexes are for the whole rest of this session. Um, the use case that we had, let's just remind ourselves, not that I've forgotten, of course, is can we just make a map showing which potential property lo locations across New York State have the biggest potential market for us? So what we are going to do, sorry, I'm not sure if you can see this, but I've got all the Zoom sidebars blocking all the most important parts of my screen. What we need to do is for each of our uh, coffee vendors, we need to work out what is the population who are likely to use a coffee shop? Um, what's the size of that population? Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is take this coffee connoisseur index and attach the information from that to our population layer. So we have all of the data at one geography so we can compare them and contrast them and turn them into basically one, one variable. So the way we do that, I'm not gonna actually do this now because this is a data visualization webinar, not a data analysis layer webinar, um, but just so you're aware, Carto has for all of our users, something called the analytics toolbox, which is a series of advanced SQL functions that we have created for our users to help them. What we would do in a case like this is uh, something called an enriched grid. Uh, you might know this as an area-based spatial join, which is basically where you cut, can I get back to my map? Yes, great, let's zoom in. You basically work out the proportion of each, um, each census block or whichever is your source, uh, yeah, your source geography, the proportion of that that intersects with your target geography which is our H3 index. Something mad is going on here. This is why we need tile sets for this layer. Um, we work out the proportion that intersects and we aggregate the variable based on that. So it's an area-based aggregation and anyone who works with desktop GIS project products knows how painful this can be because you have to run an intersection and maybe you need to take the data out and put it into Excel or Google Sheets and do the calculations in there and then bring it back into um, your GIS system, can you tell I've spent years doing this and I've been scarred by it? So with our enrich grid function, it's really, really simple. You just need to say, what is the H3 or the spatial index hexagon layer that you are using? What's the source layer? So well, for us, it's our coffee connoisseur layer. And then you just specify which variables you want to aggregate and it will perform all of that for you. Um, normally in, I mean, it depends on the amount of data that you have. I believe when I ran this one, it took about three minutes and we're looking at millions of H3 cells here to aggregate to. Um, so it's really not bad at all. So that gives us when we have our enrichment and I'm really trying to race through this analysis section so we can get back to the data visualization portion of this. Um, that gives us a data set where we have all of our stores. Um, just for reference, because I've realized I've got really ahead of myself there. I've switched now to Carto Workflows which is a multi-step analytical pipeline tool, which helps you to run uh, iterative multi-step analysis with very little code. You can see there is a little bit of code here because I've just loaded some data and using it, but you can do this without needing much SQL. Um, so it's a really, really helpful tool. If you can't code, don't code, don't want to code, um, this is a really helpful tool for you. So back to our use case. So now we have all of our stores and we have, we can see here 10,000 stores. Here they are on a little map preview and here's the data that is behind them. So we now have, uh, what we need to do is basically get the, the data that we just, the enriched grid we just created, we need to attach that to those stores. So to do that, first of all, we need to establish a geography for those stores. So that geography might be a walk catchment, a drive catchment. I've just created a quick 1200 meter buffer, which is about a 15 minute walk. So we can preview that on a map. Looks horrendous, but does the trick. And then we transform that into a spatial index grid and we just join those two together. You can always tell when it's one of my workflows because I've got emojis in all of them. So join those together and then we just run a quick group by, which is where we average the coffee connoisseur index across the whole of each catchment. 
and we sum the population across the whole of each catchment. And that leaves us with, drum roll, we should get sound effects on these webinars. That leaves us with a data set that has the point for each of our stores. And then we have our population and our total population living within the 15 minute catchment and the average coffee index within the 15 minute catchment. And then you can see here in create column, we're calculating something called a TAM or a total addressable market. This is basically the uh, coffee index multiplied by the population. So if you had a population of 100 and the coffee index score was 0 0.8, you multiply them together, your total addressable market would be 80. So that assumes that 80 people living in that area are really likely to want to buy some coffee. So it's quite a crude measure, but it does the trick. And then we just save that as a table. And then that's basically it for the analysis. Um, we've got our total addressable market, which is what our um, project manager was interested in. So now we're going to turn that into a map, which I've, uh, is one I've created earlier. And I'm just going to talk through some of the cartographic choices I've made here to try and make things for my uh, Turtleneck project manager <laughs> much easier. So this point layer here is the data set that we just calculated. So you can see we've got a total addressable market score ranging from the bottom 20% to the top 20%. So what I've done here, let's just go into the layer styles to learn a bit more about it. So I have used a sequential color scheme with five breaks. Um, when, so sort of a note on choosing color schemes, because that's one of the biggest questions I get asked as well is how do you know which color scheme to choose? Um, it's, it completely varies depending on your use case. My personal favorites are probably this one, which is the yellow through to orange through to pink, or this one, which is the yellow through to green through to blue. I really like using those ones because you have those three colors within one color, bland, color band. It's really easy for the map user to differentiate between the color uh, categories. Um, someone also once said to me, I can't remember when, I think it was way back in 20, 2009 when I first started using GIS, someone once said to me, you should never have more than 10 colors on a map because people can't differentiate between the colors. I don't know if that's true or based on fact at all, but I've sort of taken that to heart and use, use that very much when I'm making maps and try not to have more than seven colors in one layer. Um, but very, very much with color schemes, it's, it's personal preference. It's what your project manager likes. I, I really like to use ones where it's really easy to differentiate colors. Something also to be aware of is different colors have different associations in the world. So things like red, like it depends where you're from, um, but I, I'm from the UK, as you might be able to tell. Red, obviously, in the UK, it has bad connotations, connotations with danger, connotations with heat, things like blue, connotations with water, green often means good. So trying to stick to somewhat neutral colors can be really helpful unless you are trying to portray that something is bad or something is good. And then just a note on the different types of color schemes. So here we're using sequential. Sequential should be used for when you have numeric values and you're showing a gradual change to those numeric values. So here we're going from our bottom 20% values up to our top 20% values. One of the biggest um, uh, faux pas I see in data visualizations is when people use a diverging color scheme to represent something sequential. So diverging color schemes are where you have a neutral central color. So that might be white or yellow most commonly. And then they have two different colors moving away from that central one. So often it's like red through to green, uh, blue through to orange, that sort of thing. And that's really useful, particularly for representing change. So if something is getting bigger or smaller over time, faster or slower, that sort of thing. But typically for something like this, where you're going bottom 20% to top 20%, this wouldn't really be appropriate because it implies that there is a middle break point. Um, so that's definitely a really big takeaway, I think. And then also something to be aware of is this color scheme. So I often see loads of maps of people using red and green. Um, often it's a very helpful color scheme because like I mentioned just now, they sort of denote good and bad, positive, negative, uh, faster, slower, whatever. Um, I think something like 12%, I'm sure someone in the chat will know the exact right value for this. But something like 12% of men have red green color blindness. It's a lot smaller for women, but a really big percentage of men have red green color blindness. So if you use maps that have red and green as really important colors, they might not be able to tell them apart. There are loads of tools online where you can sort of take a screenshot, run your map through it and check 
to see if it um, is colorblind friendly. So if you do want to use a red screen color scheme, really recommend you do something like that. Um, so that's pretty much it for my note on color schemes. Um, so other things I've done here is I've added a stroke color around the edge of these, a really, really thin stroke. So it's only um, one pixel. Um, what's really useful about this is it means that you can different, differentiate between individual points. So if you were doing something um, like where your user was only really interested in sort of a general trend, that wouldn't really be a problem. But here we're interested in those individual stores. We need to make sure that they can differentiate between them. If I take that stroke off now, you can see pretty ugly. So we want to keep that on. Uh, and then I think that's pretty much everything on the styling for that. Um, so I just want to take a second to talk about widgets because you can see on the side here, I've got all of these charts. So in Carter Builder, you can head to uh, this panel called widgets where you can add on, in fact, I will show you now. You can add on all of these different widgets that are dynamic. And if I just pan and zoom, you can see their inputs change as you zoom around the map uh, to help your user understand their data. So what I've done here is, and I use this probably more than any other widget in maps, is added a category widget, which is kind of like a bar chart. And it shows the top five uh, locations for any particular column. So you can see here, I've used our total addressable market. And this is really helpful because the user, our user wants to know what are the top locations? So they can just select the top locations and see them immediately. They don't have to, so let's just turn that off for a second. They don't have to sort of scroll out and look at this whole map and think, oh, well, there's loads of pink down here. So the top location is probably somewhere down here and then try and work it out themselves. They can use this widget to really quickly just say, here are my top ones, found them. Um, and then another really useful thing you can do once they have that information is you can add on pop-ups. So we have a pop-up uh, menu here. You can see there's two options here. You can do a click or a hover. I've just done a click. So when someone clicks on this pop-up, they can find out all of this extra information about uh, each of these locations. Because we all know you can give this map to someone and then it will immediately say, well, what's the population like there? What's the coffee index score there? If you've got this information, they can just find it out themselves, saves them time, saves you time. Uh, so the way that you can add this on, you can use this button here to just turn on the fields that you want. Um, I can show you with this actually. So you enable the pop-up or the hover and you select the style that you want. And then you just add on your fields like so. Or you can switch it to HTML, which is what I've done. And that gives you the ability to customize to your heart's content, the style of your pop-up to make it really helpful for your user. Uh, so something else that I've done to extra help them find the top locations is added on a couple more widgets. So I've added on this range filter so they can filter the data to only see uh, total addressable markets of certain, um, certain values. And then I've also added on a histogram so they can really see the sort of shape of the data. It can be quite difficult for people to sort of gauge the shape of data from a map. So work out sort of the distribution of them in terms of the total addressable market, work out, but we can actually see here that a huge, proportion of our total addressable market is actually on the really low end and it's only a really small number that have those really high values. And then something I always try and do with visualizations as well is just try and anticipate the kind of questions that people will be asking once you've done this. It's very rare that you create a map and someone's like, perfect, yep, job done, I'll make my decision from that. They'll have more questions. So part of that might be adding these pop-ups so they can find out all the information that went into your analysis. And that's really important as well. When you're running analysis, people often say why or Pro prove it, prove that that happens. So if you have these pop-ups in here, that can really, really help sort of so they can see the background information that went into your day, into your analysis. You can also do things like, so I've added on here, the total address addressable market as a layer. So if they want, they can turn that on and inspect that data themselves and work out how you got the results that you did. Um, and then something that they could also do you can see here I've added another category legend on where people can filter data by brands. I think that would be a really common question. So I'll be like, oh, but I actually really want to put the coffee just in a Starbucks or something. Mean, it probably would be a Starbucks. They do their own coffee. But you can filter, you can add something like this and they can really quickly see where are all the Starbucks across New York State. 
and no surprises, there's loads of them. Um, so the final thing that I wanted to show you, once they've sort of looked at that, all that information and they've got, they've got all of that and they've played around with it, I really anticipate that someone would look at a map like this and be like, well, obviously it's going to be in Manhattan, isn't it? Obviously the total addressable market is going to be in Manhattan. But what if I'm only interested in looking in areas outside Manhattan? I know how expensive Manhattan is. I know how expensive it would be to route my uh, trucks through Manhattan. I don't want to put it there. If you can anticipate questions like that, then you can build that into your map. So something that we've brought into Carto fairly recently is parameters. So this is where you can basically allow your users to analyze data in a really controlled way. So I'll illustrate with an example. Here we've got a list of all of the regions across New York. So what I can do, this, this parameter is basically a filter. So let's just turn off all of, all of our regions apart from Western New York. And you can see here that what that's done is just filtered our data to, to Western New York. If we look in the widgets, we can now see that they've all changed and they're only showing the data in this location, uh, which is super helpful. And something to note as well, when you're using, uh, when you're setting up your color ramps, if you use some one of the predefined ones that we have, like quantize or quantile, um, so quantize is where you have equal breaks across the distribution of your data and quantile is where they're divided by percentage. So with this one, we have five breaks. So the bottom 20% of values are in yellow and so on. Um, if you choose one of the predefined ones that we have, they will automatically change depending on the data that you've selected on your map. So this is automatically sort of reclassified itself. So it's still really easy for the user to see which are the highest ones here. So we can do that for Western New York. We could add on Southern tier. Uh, I don't know where that is, so I need to zoom out to find it. There it is, right next to it. Um, so this is really helpful if you know you've got a pesky project manager who's going to be like, no, I don't want to look in Manhattan, or no, I, I need to know this. If you can preempt the questions that people are going to ask, then you can build all of that into your visualization. And that's what's so exciting about these interactive maps that we're all able to create now, is you can spend so much less time making them because you don't have to go back and forth with creating a PDF and then changing a little bit or rerunning your analysis. You can build all of that in and they can do it themselves in a controlled way. So I'll just quickly show you how they set those up because I noticed that I'm getting to the end of my time and I'm sure my moderator is getting antsy. Um, so in here in sources, so you can see these are the sources of all the data that I have in my map. Uh, some of them are tables, some of them are queries. In fact, I'll just show you a query now. So you can see that you can add in data as a query and sort of analyze it and adapt it as you want in that way. Or you can just add data as a table without any SQL at all. But for parameters, you just click on add a SQL parameter. You choose whichever you want. So numeric ranges are in development, but at the moment you can choose between text and dates. Click on text and then you could say, I want my parameter to be regions. It generates a name. And then you can either manually add in values or say, I want to add in values uh, from a data set and it will generate those. Uh, we've only got those two data sets turned on, uh, those two variables turned on at the moment. So you can only choose from Western New York and Southern tier. Um, so that's pretty much how you create the parameter. And then you go into, to implement that, you go into your SQL editor. And here you can see, you just have those, I don't know the name of those brackets, but you just use those to add that into your, um, add that into your query. Now here I've used this as basically a filter but it doesn't have to be a filter. You could do something like, if you know that your project manager, for example, is gonna be like, oh, why did you do a 15 minute walk catchment like we did? It should be a 10 minute walk catchment. You could have a parameter that has loads of different catchment levels. So 10 minute, five minute, 15 minute, they could select the parameter. They could select the value they wanted. You could build that into your SQL query and it would run all of that analysis for you. Um, so let's just turn all of that back on because now what we're going to do is share this map with our project manager. So this hopefully is going to be really helpful for our project manager to work out where are the locations they want to expand to. If they want to look in all of New York, it will probably be Alphabet Bar and Cafe or Cafe uh, down here in Manhattan. But it might be they want to use the parameters to find somewhere 
in a slightly maybe more affordable or accessible part of Manhattan and they could use all, all of these decisions that I've made they can use to help make that decision. So the final thing we would do is click here on the shared button and choose our sharing modes. At the moment I have this shared to the public but I could equally have this shared to private. I could have this shared so only I could see it. I could share it with my organization. So all 184 Carto uh, people in my organization could see it, or I could like I have share it with the public and you can also protect it with a password. So that means that you can share it with just individuals. Um, so very flexible in terms of sharing possibilities. So that's pretty much it for that use case. I hope that was useful. I'm just gonna head back to my slides because if I remember rightly, I had another couple. Great. So um, as you can probably tell, this is a really, really whistle-stop tour of data visualization. I wanted it to be very practical and best practice uh, orientated. I didn't want to just show you all of the thing, amazing things you can do with Carto for data visualization. And there's so much more I would love to have shown you. So for example, we've recently released a photorealistic 3D mapping capability, and you can see some examples down here. So you've got that for the terrain, but also you can drape your data over buildings, really beautiful um, appearance, and it make, helps make maps super engaging. You can also create custom maps and your own sort of custom widgets and integrate um, your map in a wider app environment. And we also have DeckGL integration. So there's loads more I can talk about. If this is something that people have enjoyed and would like to see about this, then we can absolutely do more sessions like this. Um, so I hope in the last 52 minutes, um, A, you've enjoyed yourself and seen the maps that you maybe are inspired by, seen some things you want to try yourself, but also I hope you've come away from this thinking, actually, data visualization is really important. And if I do it well, it can save me a lot of headaches, a lot of time and really shorten that time to insight that we all want to achieve. Um, I also hope you've learned that the user journey is really, really key to successful mapping in modern GIS, and we're no longer just able to just sort of plonk things, well, not plonk things on a map, but we can't, because we're not making static maps anymore. We have to think about the user experience rather than just design. Um, and then finally, I hope you've liked what you've seen about Carto and been inspired about how it can help you with your data visualization. Like I said, um, we have a free two week trial for anyone. Um, so please do head over to carto.com and get yourself signed up. And we have, if you go over to the Carto blog, we have loads of resources that can help get you started on your data visualization journey. And I believe that's everything. I can't believe I got through it in the time. I really thought I wouldn't. Um, so uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, if I can find the Q&A. Okay, let me start at the top. I'll, I'll just do a couple, but you can see here, here are my contact details. You can email me at hmpenzi.carto.com or you can find me on any social media platform, including even threads, which I don't quite know how to use, but feel free to drop me a line on anything. I'd love to love to chat a bit more. Uh, so a couple of questions. Uh, do you have, in fact, let me stop sharing my screen. You don't need to see your questions back to you. Okay. Do you have a GIS portfolio? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, if you head over to helenmatesmaps.com, I've got a few, um, I've got a portfolio and I've got some tutorials over there to help you. And similarly on Carto, quite a lot of the maps on the Carto website are by myself and other people. And we've got loads of tutorials on there to help get started as well as on our documentation. Uh, so thank you, uh, Puneet. What thought process or principles do you use to decide on the right method, if such a thing exists, for implementing, for implementing informational hierarchy on maps, whether that means tooltips upon hovering, zoom upon clicking, always visible insets, sidebars, layer selection, slash toggling, et cetera? Wow, what a question. Um, I hope, I think you asked that quite early on in the session. So I hope I illustrated that for you a bit. It's all about what does the user want to get from the map? What, what are the decision are they trying to make and helping them I saw, it's almost like a two-step process for me the first step of the process is what information do they need to make that decision as quickly as possible and I do what I can there to get them there as quickly as possible the second step is and what are they ask, likely to ask next and how can I make sure they've got all that information in there as well um, to make their life easier also to make my life easier um I hope that answers your question. It's a, it's a very tricky one. It's very subjective, but it's all, it's all about that user. And it really depends on, like I mentioned about that 
that question, what is the question that you're trying to answer? Um, that's, that's really key in informing that decision. Um, what base map do you use in Carto? So in Carto Builder, that's a question from Tony. Thank you, Tony. Um, in Carto Builder, we have two main options. You can use a Carto base map um, where we have uh, a few different options. So we have light map, dark map. We have a sort of more detailed colorful map. And then we have our Google base maps, uh, which have similar options. But what's great about the Google base maps is they break the text layer and the imagery layer apart. So you can have text on top of your data, which is really helpful. But the downside with Google base maps, like I showed you, is you can't alter the pitch as much when you're doing 3D maps. Um, but they also have aerial imagery and terrain imagery. So there's loads and loads of different choices. And often the choice of base map um, is really tricky. So like I mentioned earlier, I like to use dark base maps when I'm working on screens or showing um, sequential data because often sequential data has a light value and a very bright value. And they're quite hard to see on a light base map, but very easy to see on a dark base map. And I like to use light base maps for um, if I'm printing maps. And then for things like if I'm working in a very uh, natural area where there's not much human um, infrastructure, maybe I'll use aerial imagery. Uh, so it's all, all sort of depends on the context. Um, and I think, let me just see if I can get through one more question for the end. Uh, what's the tool for creating this pipeline? I believe this might have been earlier when we were looking at Carto workflows. The answer is Carto workflows, um, which is a, it's kind of like a flow diagram interface and it helps you, it means you can do sort of multi-stage analysis, connect different pieces together. It's really, really intuitive, really visual, really great if you, aren't a coder. I'm not a huge coder. I'm pretty decent at SQL, but it definitely helps me a lot with the bits of SQL that I am not so good at. Um, so Carter Workflows, really recommend you give it a go. And then I think we've got, finally, let's go for Alexander. Which approaches do you use for storytelling? Do you guide users or something like this? For me, it's a great explorative approach you showed us. Thank you. Um, it very much depends. It depends on the question. I think for storytelling, you need to know what the end game is and in a way sometimes you tell a story back to front a lot with mapping I think so you start with what's the answer so like in the map that I just showed you we started with the answer which was it's the alphabet cafe in New York they can really quickly get to the alphabet cafe um, and then as they delve into it they're like well how did you get to that answer what's the population what's the coffee index um, what if I don't want to open a story in New York. So in a way, mapping, it, it depends on the context, but I often find it's a back to front storytelling. You start with the answer and then you say how you got there. Um, but it, it completely depends. It depends on your audience more than anything um, and what they're trying to get out of it. Um, I believe that's us pretty much at time, I'm afraid. I don't want to make my moderator stay any later than she needs to. I think it's late where she is. Um, but what I will do is take a screenshot of all of these questions and see if I can get back to you all um, individually. And like I said, um, my contact details, hmckenzie at carto.com is my email address, or find me on any of your preferred social media platforms at Helen Makes Maps um, and drop me a line. And I'd love to chat some more about data visualization. Um, so yeah, thank you so much again for coming. I really hope you found it useful and interesting. Um, I absolutely love delivering this. So um, thank you for coming along. Um, if this is something you found interesting, like I said, this is quite a high level um, principles based session. So if you'd be interested in more that are looking sort of delving into individual tools um, and really doing a deep dive on anything that I touched on, um, then yeah, drop, drop me a line and we can absolutely set something like that up. Um, thank you so much. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye.